we're here at Hawaii Dermatology Seminar speaking with Dr. Ash Margoob, a renowned melanoma expert from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Uh, Dr. Margoob, is it time for a new system of classifying nevi? So in my opinion, yes. Um, so up until now, we have sort of a, in my view, a very uh, simplistic way of classifying nevi. We classify them as being either congenital, present at birth, or acquired. By and large, that's the classification we have. Within that, there are some morphology-driven classifications. So you have flat lesions versus raised intradermal nevi. Um, we call Una's nevi and Mischer's nevi. But by and large, it's a fairly narrow uh, group of lesions that we, we classify. The reason that this classification started was a way to find out which lesions are at risk for melanoma or pose an increased risk for melanoma for the patient. In that investigation, one of the things that was found out very early is that lesions that were large, so larger than five millimeters, uh, uh, they were associated with a higher risk than patients that had lesions that were smaller than that. And that uh, gave rise to this uh, uh, terminology, dysplastic nevi, atypical mole, Clark's nevi, large acquired nevi. And so it was known for the last 30 or 40 years that we do need to subclassify nevi into groups so as to better stratify for melanoma risk. And by that, we then identify groups of individuals that would benefit most from targeted screening. That's really the impetus behind uh, this whole evolution of how we classify nevi. But we have known also now that uh, there are lots of flaws in, uh, in the classification we have. For example, many acquired nevi are probably not truly acquired. They are small tardive uh, nevi that are sitting in the skin that then evolve over the course of time so they were truly congenital from the start not not really acquired um, and we also have an understanding that there are probably different pathways towards nevogenesis so some may arise from stem cells in the skin others from these incipient nests in the skin um, and so depending on where the pathways are what the driver mutations are uh, will probably uh, uh, change the way we classify nevi and that is starting to emerge now so on the molecular uh, front we are starting to know that there are mutations like GNAC mutations associated with blue nevi and BRAF mutations associated with globular nevi and so forth so on that uh, can better stratify or segregate uh, these nevi into subsets um, and then the hope is that we will be able to better predict which subsets uh, are associated with melanoma risk either within the lesion itself or um, uh, poses an increased risk to the patient. Um, and that's where it's all headed. Um, and uh, what we are also learning is that the molecular profiles that we are seeing to some extent or to a pretty great extent actually also correlate with morphology uh, that we see clinically and also on dermoscopy. So I think that we, as our understanding grows we will start to come out with subsets of nevi that have a certain clinical and dermoscopic morphology. And we will also note that this morphologic set of lesions have a certain driver mutation or genetic profile. And with that understanding, we'll be then better able to uh, predict which patients are, uh, would benefit most from being under very rigorous surveillance uh, with the aim, obviously, to find melanomas early and then cure them. And because of the correlation with morphology, uh, you're not you're not suggesting that we'd have to do molecular testing on every suspicious lesion because the lesion is telling you a story through its appearance. Correct. So initially, obviously, in, in collecting sure. this information, we need to know what are the uh, molecular profiles of a given group of lesions, correlate that with the morphology, okay? And then once we have that understanding, I, I don't think we would need to do molecular profiling on every single lesion. I think we will get a very good understanding that this particular morphology, let's say it's a globular nevus, that it's associated with a BRAF mutation. Um, and although there will be a small subpopulation that won't have that, the majority will. And that information by itself, in terms of finding which population to target for screening, will be sufficient. But obviously at this point, we still need that uh, to find out what, what is the correlation between the the, the mutation profile of a given and its morphology on the clinical. Well, let me put you on the spot. When would you predict uh, the term dysplastic nevus will 
go away. <laughs> I don't know if it'll ever go away. Okay, so I think the 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 term may be here uh, to stay for it, throughout my career. But I think the concept that the word dysplasia uh, uh, engenders, right, needs to be removed. See that 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 the term dysplasia somehow says to an individual who's not very familiar with this topic that this is a lesion that is on its way to melanoma. And this clearly is not the case. What it does tell us is that the patient who has a subgroup of nevi that are larger than five millimeters, that can clinically look a little bit irregular, right? That that group of individuals are at higher risk for melanoma. That is clear, right? And so what you call that lesion at this point doesn't matter. You can call it dysplastic, atypical, large acquired nevus. I mean, maybe change it to something else, a flower nevus, a rose nevus, right? So it's not, the name is not so important. It's the concept that this subgroup of lesions with this particular morphology, clinical morphology, are at higher risk for developing melanoma on their skin, not necessarily in the nevus, but anywhere on their skin. That is the concept. And, and my opinion is that the word dysplasia, for people who are not really into this topic, engenders feelings of angst, right? Sure. Because of the word dysplasia. So, uh, you know, doing something, you know, having a term that doesn't engender that, that negative feeling um, may do a service. But to answer your question, I'm not sure it'll ever disappear, right? Because it's so ingrained in our literature. But hopefully as we get these subtypes and the, and the driver mutations and the profiles may, uh, subclassifications may change based on, let's say, dermoscopy. So instead of saying dysplasia, we'll be saying globular nevi versus reticular nevi versus homogeneous nevi versus blue nevi versus starburst nevi versus multi-component nevi. That that kind of system will eventually get rid of this uh, term of dysplasia. But I'm not sure that'll happen in my lifetime. Well, I think it's safe to say it's an exciting time, not just in the therapy of advanced melanoma, but in the advancement of the state of early detection diagnosis. Absolutely. Yeah.